Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Avengers Endgame celebrated its internet-breaking opening day of ticket sales with a new trailer. Oh, you know, just a one-minute special look that somehow reveals more from the movie than the past full-length trailers combined. You trust me? I do. Yeah, I don't. The directors warned us that this promo footage could be CGI trickery to keep us guessing. So as I break down this trailer frame by frame for all the details that you might have missed, I'm gonna be on high alert for the stuff that might be faked. You're not fooling us this time, Russos. Spoiler warning in case I accidentally predict anything right and ruin your life. Let's get started. If we do this, we'd be going in short-handed. Yeah, you mean because he killed all our friends? We owe this to everyone who's not in this room to try. Okay, this trailer opens with an exterior shot of Avengers HQ. This is the same gate that Scott Lang showed up at in security camera footage in the first Endgame trailer. This could be that moment he arrives, having recently escaped from the Quantum Realm somehow. And let's not forget that footage was labeled Archive, suggesting that we could be looking at some kind of timeline meddling. Inside, Bruce Banner and the other Avengers debate taking another shot at Thanos in the aftermath of the snap. Now in other videos, I've suggested that the first act of Endgame could feature some rushed payback attempt by the Avengers that could actually make their situation a lot worse. Another failure to further humiliate them. By we'd be going in shorthanded, Banner could be implying that in addition to half their fighters, he's also still experiencing Hulk performance anxiety. Bringing up the question, when will the Hulk come back? Could he be in semi-intelligent Professor Hulk form? Let me know in the comments below what you think the trigger moment will be. Meanwhile, Thor carves up with a bowl of what looks like King's Hawaiian sweet rolls and a can of beer, zooming in hands on that bad boy. And you can see it's in Athena from the Creature Comforts Brewery in Athens, Georgia, not far from the Atlanta Pinewood Studios lot where these movies are filmed. I imagine a lot of the actors and crew people like drinking from this local brewery. I just hope this whole sob fest ends with Thor shotgunning the beer, crushing it, and shouting another! There's also a shot of Natasha moping in the rain. And judging from the official Black Widow hair clock, it's looking mostly red, with the blonde being flushed out of the tips, suggesting that this is after other events when her hair is shorter and blonder, meaning this moping could be after some early loss. And our other hair clock is the rug on Cap's face. And in the shot of him at the mirror, he appears to have just shaved the rug, meaning that this could be even earlier before some Act 1 mission. Let's move on. It's not about how much we lost. It's about how much we have left. Where's the Avengers? We gotta finish this. Okay, a quick shot of the Quinjet over Tokyo that we've seen before. This is probably Natasha going to Japan to find Hawkeye. Then a shot of Rocket holding Nebula's hand, showing that a waste of parts can feel. They're on the ramp of the Benatar, and judging from the shot of Pepper hugging Tony, this could be the moment that Tony and Nebula return to Earth. They could be what Cap, Natasha, Banner, and Rhodey, and digitally removed character were looking up at on the lawn. Digitally removed character or just Drax, standing very still. Karen Gillan hinted months ago that she would have a new BFF in Endgame. And it looks like Rocket is her new shoulder to cry on. It's especially sad when you consider that this is a moment when the two surviving Guardians of the Galaxy learn about the casualties on the other side. Like Nebula is realizing Groot has dusted, and Rocket is realizing Quill, Gamora, Mantis, and Drax are all gone. These two aren't really known for physical affection, but Rocket's heartbreak leads him to reach out in a very similar way that Drax reached out to console him at the end of the first Guardians. Then there's a shot of Iron Man in his new Mark 85 armor. It's thick and its shoulders, arms, and legs are gold-colored, similar to Iron Man's throwback classic armor in the Silver Age comics. But I'm more curious about the context of this scene. Iron Man is flying high enough that he's probably up near Avengers Tower. Also, the background of New York looks bright, relatively normal. A definite contrast with the dreary, apocalyptic Manhattan that we saw in past trailers is covered in the dust of Mets fans. There's also the fact that Iron Man's armor is the Mark 85. Like, the last suit we saw was the Mark 50, the sleek nanotech suit that he wore in Infinity War. So why is Tony iPhone Xing us? To me, this brings me back to the timeline meddling theory, suggesting that the Avengers will use some quantum technology maybe to change the timeline and revisit past MCU moments, like the Battle of New York in the first Avengers movie. So we could be seeing Stark reliving his moment with Selvig and Loki at the top of Avengers Tower in that battle. But another angle on this theory is that the Avengers could already be 
in a time loop established by Doctor Strange, one that will require them to lose up to over 14 million times, until they figure out the one sequence of history in which they beat Thanos. This could justify the movie's three hour runtime and why Tony would have burned through so many generations of Iron Man armor. I like this theory, I think I'll go into it more in a future video. There's also a shot of Clint Barton, Hawkeye. His arm is now covered with the sleeve tattoo. And let's zoom in and enhance on this fine print. You can definitely make out a skull inside Japanese warrior armor. This reflects Clint's new role as Ronin, the Japanese lone warrior from the Marvel comics. The skull could symbolize how he's dead inside, perhaps from seeing his party of five dust down into a party of one. During this footage, we hear the voice of Tony Stark. We're the Avengers. We gotta finish this. Now, audio in general in trailers is almost always manipulated, dubbed in from other scenes. But Tony's words here sound especially familiar. That's because his We're the Avengers is actually the exact audio lifted from his line in Avengers Age of Ultron. We're the Avengers. Where's the Avengers? And this was an especially significant moment to call back to, because listen to the full clip. We're the Avengers. We can bust arms dealers all the live long day, but that up there, that's, that's the end game. That's right, this was the first time the word Endgame came up as Stark warned about cosmic threats like Thanos. Also, uh, people are telling me that the German version of this trailer features Tony saying a different line in the scene. I told you we would lose, but you said we would do that together, which would also be a callback to the final exchange of the same scene in Ultron. We'll lose, and we'll do that together too. Now, I know the Russos admitted to using footage and audio from past films for these trailers, but I have a feeling that this Age of Ultron moment wasn't a coincidence. But I will also dig in this more in that other video. There's a shot of Natasha, followed by a new angle of Thor summoning Stormbreaker past an unflinching Captain Marvel. Doesn't even blink. And then this solemn group shot of the survivors in Avengers HQ. They're all together. Hawkeye, Rhodey, Stark, Cap, Nebula, Rocket, Scott Lang, and Natasha. But I gotta say, this shot just looks really posed to me. Everyone's standing, facing the same direction, with the same bland look on their faces, like they're the goddamn Backstreet Boys. Now sure, they could be facing other characters not in this angle, like Thor and Captain Marvel, just standing on the other side of the room maybe. Or maybe this is from the end of the movie and all the dusted are fading back into the timeline. Like notice how Natasha is holding her shoulder like she's sore or wounded, like after a fight. But yeah, my instinct is telling me that this whole lineup could just be the end game equivalent of that whole group jog from the Infinity War trailer that ended up not being in the movie, but let's move on to the next clip. You trust me. I do. You could not live with your own failure. Okay, let's dig into Aladdin and Jasmine here. Stark and Cap appear to be in New York, maybe even the battle of it. You can see emergency lights in the background, and as sweet as it is to see these two frenemies finally shake hands and make up, something definitely seems off about it and I'm about to throw up all over it. Look at Cap. He appears to be wearing his dark blue torn suit that he had in Infinity War, which would be a little odd because in other shots, Cap wears his Winter Soldier stealth suit. Also another suit that looks a bit new, maybe a bit retro. Now some are saying the shot of the handshake could be a different character, but I think we're just seeing a different Cap. And this could be some of that CGI trickery that the Russos were talking about. Just Look at his suit again, it looks a bit off. The scales are kind of different, the surfaces are smoother, a bit more rubbery, and that strap buckle could be a feature on a Ready Player One avatar. Maybe Marvel's VFX artist painted this Infinity War era suit over a different Cap suit. And if we are talking timeline meddling, Stark could be talking to a younger Captain America, who, remember, did have a much brighter suit during the Battle of New York. Stark could be trying to convince him to trust this much older tone Tony Stark to help this old man grab both the Tesseract and Loki's scepter because this old crazy Stark from the future is babbling on how they're actually Infinity Stones and he needs to erase them from history. Come on, you trust me, right? I do. But there's actually another possible clue of this whole theory in the next shot, showing the Benatar jumping into light speed. Now you can barely make out a few people sitting in the back seats of that cockpit, but actually take a closer look at what planet they're departing. Now before, I assume this could just be Tony and Nebula finally figuring out how to jumpstart the Benatar and return to Earth, but that purplish planet behind them with the multiple moons? That looks a lot like Morag, the abandoned planet at the beginning of the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Why is Morag important? Well, the temple 
on this planet was the resting place of the orb containing the Power Stone before Peter Quill removed it. So, in the same way that the surviving Avengers could revisit the events of the first Avengers movie to retrieve those Infinity Stones, they might do the same with the events of Guardians of the Galaxy and all of the past Marvel films that featured the stones. Now, this shot of the Benatar cuts to a different shot of the same ship featuring Rocket and Captain Marvel in the pilot and co-pilot seats, Cap, Thor, Rhodey, and Natasha, and I think Nebula might be somewhere back there too. But check it in with our hair clock. Black Widow still has it short and blonde, suggesting that this would take place shortly after the events of the snap, and shortly after they team up with Captain Marvel early on in the film. So like notice how Banner and Tony are not joining them, suggesting that this might be a haphazard assault that the more intellectual Avengers might prefer to sit out. In fact, this group's so trigger happy that Thor doesn't even bother to wear a seatbelt. Uh oh, maybe he's like Drax and he has sensitive nipples. I actually think that this is the mission that Cap and Natasha were embarking on in the first Endgame trailer, the desperate one that Steve wouldn't know what to do if it failed. And we see a possible destination for that mission here with the shot of Thanos' ship, the Sanctuary 2, surrounded by various Q ships. Notice the red lights on that ship. They could be the same red lights that lit the tunnel that Hawkeye appeared in in the last trailer, the one that we realized recently was filled with Outriders. Assuming that some of the Avengers do try to strike back against Thanos in the first act, I don't really feel good about all of them coming back alive, especially Captain Marvel. We've seen her alive in Avengers HQ and co-piloting the ship, but that's it. The early loss of the Avengers' biggest ace in the hole could plunge their rock bottom even lower and make their eventual victory over Thanos, hopefully, that much more earned. There's also a shot of Stark looking at this photo of him and Peter Parker. Now, it looks like they're holding Peter's Stark Industries certificate, maybe the one that Stark told Aunt May that Peter won in order to discreetly recruit him back in Civil War, but notice how they're holding it upside down. Now, the bar behind Tony looks a little similar to his penthouse bar, the one that was atop Avengers Tower. Also, the shirt he's wearing kind of looks like his Black Sabbath shirt that he was also wearing during that confrontation with Loki, which, if they do revisit it in this movie, would be another interesting moment that foreshadowed the events to come in the MCU. Because if we can't protect the Earth, you can be damn well sure we'll avenge it. But let's move on to the final clip. Where did that bring you? Back to me. Okay, here, there's a quick shot of Thor in a similar location to where we saw him in the Super Bowl promo. But then there's this interesting shot of Rocket. Look at the pattern on the floor behind him. It looks a lot like the pattern on the floor of Thanos' throne room in the Sanctuary 2, which we saw in that scene between Thanos and Gamora. Here, Rocket looks particularly sad. Notice also the sparks that float past him. Like, I'm wondering if he's witnessing the fiery death of one of his companions. Or maybe he has an emotional reaction to Thanos for a different reason. Rocket's origin is still very much a mystery. His bio data in Guardians Volume 1 listed his home planet as Half-World, but he was cybernetically engineered by some cruel scientist, and the movies have never established who that was. One theory that I brought up before is that it could have been Thanos, and that Rocket could be one of the children of Thanos. That could be why Rocket chose to go with Thor to help him get his new god-killer weapon, instead of facing Thanos directly with the other Guardians. In a deleted scene set in Thanos' throne room, Thanos uses the Reality Stone to project a memory in which Gamora served as a loyal child of Thanos, Maybe Endgame will feature a similar flashback in the setting for Rocket. But next up, there's this shot of Cap struggling on the ground with his classic shield. This could be right before he gets to his feet and tightens his strap that we've seen in the other shots. Now, over all this footage, the voice of Thanos rings out, taunting us, You could not live on with your own failure. And where did that bring you? Back to me. The exact words of every pizza box as it flaps open as I go back for another piece. And we finally see the Mad Titan here. But there are two interesting details about him in this shot. First, he's back in his armor. Remember, Thanos removed his battle armor at the beginning of Infinity War. Because once he acquired the Power Stone and the Space Stone, getting the final stones was more of a spiritual quest for him than one that he needed to physically fight through. Seeing him back in his armor now suggests that he feels threatened, that he's afraid of getting hurt, that he's worried that he has something to lose. But there's another clue that he might not have the full power of the Infinity Gauntlet. The way he arrives. With the Space Stone, Thanos could open a wormhole, a portal in space, and teleport wherever he wanted. But now, it's different. He beams in. Now, some are describing this as the Bifrost that Thor uses to get around. But I don't think this is the Bifrost. The Bifrost has a rainbowy color to it. This beam is pure blue. Actually, this is exactly how we saw the Black Order beam down from the Q-ship. The fact that Thanos has to do this, along with his need to wear armor, suggests that the Avengers 
have probably made some headway at getting at least some of the stones away from him. Then we see Stark in his Iron Man armor walking among some smoky rebel. It looks like the same battlefield as the one that we saw Cap and the others fighting on. The trailer's money shot joins him with Cap and Thor, the Marvel Trinity, as they march upon Thanos. You can see him sitting in the background there, perhaps a bit similar to the way Doctor Strange did as he waited for Thanos on Titan, but was really setting a trap for him. Beside Thanos is his new weapon, a double-sided sword blade thingy that we saw in concept art and in some toy releases. Answer's always in the toys. And if you look closely, you can see how Thanos hung his helmet on top of that. But where is this battle taking place? The rubble looks like some construction scaffolding, meaning this is probably somewhere on Earth. And it looks like there will be one battle scene set at Avengers HQ, suggesting that Thanos could attack the facility as the Avengers start to make progress against him. But another theory that a lot of you have brought up to me is that if we are looking at a replay of the Battle of New York, Timeline Medlin, this Medlin could lead to a ripple effect in which that nuke that was fired at the city, rather than being carried up to the wormhole by Iron Man and thrown at the Chitauri, could instead detonate over New York and reduce the city to rubble. And if you're looking for a high stakes backdrop for the Avengers' final confrontation with Thanos, the ashes of New York City is a pretty bleak option. Then again, folks, all this footage is rumored to just be from the first act of the movie and the Russos might have just CGI'd all of it to screw with us. So comment down below with your favorite moment from this trailer. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at EA Boss. Hey, and if you plan to go to VidCon this year, please tweet at VidCon to let them know that you'd love to see us in a panel, a live show, a meet and greet, so that we can thank you guys in person for all of your support. And if you live in the LA area, you can come check out my live comedy show, Darkest Timeline Comedy, with me, Mod, Philip, and Sam, this Friday, April 5th, and every first Friday of the month thereafter. Ticket info in the description below. And if you consider yourself a nerd, you gotta be there. Because I didn't spend a hundred bucks on this and wear it for the entire video for nothing. Snap.